Hi there, come on in. Let's get this flap out of the way about this demonstration I'm gonna do at the outdoor fair where Harry Reinfelder uses a 45 caliber bullet, shoots me in the chest while I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. This is not a publicity stunt. This is done for educational purposes. I've been sick and tired of all the stuff that's gone on television and in movies, the wrong information about guns. Yes, it's a dramatic display, but it is designed to dispel some myths that kids have gotten, particularly from television. We'll have more on that coming up. Pheasants, fishing, a lot coming your way, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. This is Fletcher Pond, also known as Fletcher's Floodwaters, a 10,000 acre flooding southwest of Alpena that's known for its bass and northern pike fishing. Now we christened our new boat on this pond, thought we'd give it a shakedown cruise and try out Fletcher's, at least for panfish. Greg Cash, whose kicker band sings the theme song of the show, fishes here a lot in the winter. He says the crappie and bluegill fishing is phenomenal. Now the average depth at Fletcher's is five to eight feet in most areas and when I cranked up the motor from the launch site, I really wasn't aware of the hazards in a flooding like this. Back in 1930 when the Thunder Bay River was dammed by the Alpena Power Company, the tops of trees were standing above the water line and in 1932 loggers went out on the ice in the winter and cut the trees off at water level. That left dead heads like this one just under the surface all over the flooding. I saw right away that full speed was out of the question, so I trimmed the motor up just to keep it out of trouble. On any flooding that's likely to have tree trunks just under the surface, you want to tip your motor up and run slowly all the time. Hitting a stump could shear a pin and possibly even damage the stern of the boat. To find out what's down there, I use a flasher. It's telling me we're in about eight feet of water and I do see a few small fish. Here we go, I got one. Got a fish on. A little head shaker of some type. Not a big one. Oh, not a bad one. Look at that. Oh, you got one too. Darren's got one over there. Darren Stewart from Lansing fishes quite a bit with Greg Cash, and we both caught crappie at the same time. Now, crappie like to hang around sunken treetops and branches, which is why Fletcher's is such a good crappie hole. Well, they got a lot of fins, big fins in the back, made for swimming. They, they chase minnows, scarf up minnows in their big mouths. Yeah, it's on the small side, though, in the back. Because of the underwater hazards, most fishermen on Fletcher's use small boats. You can see the minnow bucket floating off the stern. They're after crappies. And from what I could tell, there's no shortage of crappies and panfish in this pond. Well, let's see what it is. It's a rock bass. Rock bass. Whoa! Little rock bass here. <laughs> yeah, they look somewhat like a crappie. They have that dorsal fin that's connected right to the rear dorsal, the spiny dorsal and the soft dorsal. And same thing on the bottom, they had spines right along there. And a red eye, it's characteristic of a rock bass, that red eye. Fairly good sized mouth for eating minnows. And a lot of people don't care for them, they're small and they're not that tasty. Small. So back he goes. We fished the last two hours before sunset, saw a guy catch a five pound bass, but didn't catch any big ones ourselves. The next morning it was beautiful on the pond. We tried night crawlers on small hooks, but found the action was fairly constant using plastic grubs on small jigs or spinners, at least with small fish. Uh oh, crappie's a scrapper. Now he hit right at the boat. I might be able to get another one right here off to the side. Let me see if I can just, just cast out right over here. Get one to hit the trick with these little teeny spinner baits is really real slow. Just enough to get that blade, blade turning. For an all around lure that panfish will hit as well as bass and even pike from time to time, these little spinner baits are ideal. 
There we go. Time and time again. Well, I'm the king of the rock bass. I swear it's the same one I've caught 30 times. Yeah, he hasn't grown a bit. <laughs> the flasher showed six feet of water that could be tree limbs or maybe weeds or maybe small fish right off the bottom. Those little fish seem to be everywhere. This 10,000 acre impoundment is not only the home of many, many fish, but three pairs of bald eagles and 21 pairs of osprey nest on this flooding. Their main food, of course, is fish. Well, we didn't catch any big ones, but the action was steady during the few hours we spent here. I'm sure we'll be back with Greg Cash and Darren Stewart sometime again. There you go. We'll fish the other side of the pond where the bigger bass and pike are taken. One of these days, we'll get them. Catching panfish, America's favorite pastime. They're tasty, there's fun, lots of action, but some anglers prefer to spend their time going after big ones, even if they catch very few. We're talking about northern pike and muskie. There's a northern pike up there on top and a tiger muskie down at the bottom. These are both on display at our Michigan Outdoors Museum. They both qualify for our Outdoors Club Fishing Awards. This tiger muskie is a cross between a muskie and a northern pike. It grows fast, it fights hard, this one was caught in Otsego Lake by Tony Giroux of Flint. He caught it on a spinner bait. He was fishing the 21st of June, and he was fishing at 7 o'clock in the evening. 7 o'clock in the evening? Hey, that's kind of unusual. We did a computer analysis here of the trophy muskie taken in our Outdoors Club Fishing Awards. We're talking 112 muskie over the past, and these are Great Lakes muskie, over the past eight years. 7 o'clock and beyond, there were only seven muskies caught. And in fact, we go to the other end of the day, 8 a.m. and earlier, seven muskies caught. Remember, if you're a muskie angler, look at this time right here. 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., 90% of the trophy muskies are caught during these hours. <laughs> Jim Rourke Jr. from Christmas, Michigan caught this lake trout at 10 in the morning. Lake Superior off Alger County jigging with a piece of sucker right on the bottom. That laker is 35 inches long, weighed over 20 pounds. A 37-inch Scamania steelhead known for its jumping. This one caught on an alewife. Dave Lovell from Manton was fishing Benzie County, I'd guess off the Frankfurt Pier. Lou Withy from Lakeview was trolling off Frankfurt, caught this 29-pound, 39-inch king salmon on a silver streak. That was on July 4th last year. On July 5th, Cindy Nichols from Lansing caught this 41-incher, weighed 32 pounds, also trolling a silver streak off Frankfurt. Spring turkey season was a success for Dave Payne from Sparta, who called in this gobbler that had an 11 and a half inch beard. Bow hunters, here's an October buck that Terry Dalton from Lapeer got in Lapeer County. He used a PSE 64 pound compound to take this 11 pointer. Now I said earlier the trophy muskie don't very often hit early in the morning or late in the day. Bob Wilson from Farmington Hills knows that and never expected to catch this 50 inch Great Lakes muskie at eight o'clock in the morning. And my wife was running the boat and she was watching the graph and um, she said, we just went over a big fish. You know, mm -hmm. I happened to look back there at the, at the line. About the time the plugs went over him, I seen him come out of the water with the plug in his mouth. Quite a thrill. So then we, we grabbed the rod, and my, and my wife brought the boat back around here, and we, we fought the fish for a little bit. And I still couldn't see how big he was. I knew he was a big fish, but I didn't know he was this big. So I, I was kind of horsing around with him, you know. I said, well, uh, come here, get the, get, the, get the camera going. I'll take and make him jump. So I put a little pressure on him. He'd come, he come out of the water like this, and about that time, he said, whoa, you know, that's enough. Run him back down. <laughs> So then my wife went to net him, and she netted a lot of big fish, but this one was about, had an extension a little bit longer than usually a net, you know. She got right to that last little bit there, and phew, boy, we had trouble getting him in. Finally got him over the edge, got him in the boat, took second place in the uh, Michigan Ontario Muskie Club Tournament. Oh, what a deal. And you were horsing around with him because you thought yeah, he was a little Yeah, first, until he came out of the water the second time, then we, uh, you know, kind of cooled off. He came in second in the tournament, but comes in first on Michigan Outdoors because Bob Wilson from Farmington Hills is our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. The Livingston Archers will have several archery courses laid out. 
and the very popular long bear shoot, about 150 yards or so. That'll be there if a shooter hits the small target, according to the rules, he could win a Yamaha Big Bear four-wheeler donated by hackers of Houghton Lake. Nobody's won it yet, but this could be the year. Taxidermist Tim Hayes will be working on a variety of mounts all day Saturday. People have asked when Tim is going to mount that seven-point buck I got last deer season. Everybody loves a puppy, and to sportsmen, there are no cuter puppies than little hounds, retrievers, pointers, setters, beagles. They'll be at Puppy Alley at the outdoor fair this weekend. If you have puppies for sale, bring them up. Everybody loves to see them. Charlie Keenan will be moderating the sporting dog show in the athletic field. Arnold Welsh will handle the hounds. You'll see walkers, red bones, blue ticks. Four times on Saturday and twice on Sunday, Arnold's Hounds will be presented. Charlie Lindblade is our trainer who demonstrates the abilities of pointing dogs on some quail that are hidden in a box of pine boughs. Last year he had a Gordon Setter. Now this one wasn't rock solid, but it was backed up by an English Setter, which, by the way, is the most popular grouse dog in Michigan. These two were backed up by another Gordon, and this one was rock solid on point. Isn't that something? These pointing dogs, that's, that's really the beauty of hunting to bird hunters. Yellow labs, black labs, Larry and Cindy Mowski have both, and once again they'll put on a demonstration of how retrievers are trained and handled for waterfowl hunting. It's all done on dry land in the athletic field at Houghton Lake High School, but the principles of sporting dog training are easily seen and demonstrated. Between the sporting dog shows is traditional archery. Norm Blaker and Davy Blaker demonstrate aerial skills. Last year, I hit a wiffle ball. Hey! Yes? Ron LeClaire approves. He taught me those skills. If you're an archer, bring your bow. The Livingston Archers have a variety of shoots to test your skill. Oh, right dead center, yeah. Besides the novelty shoots, the Livingston Archers have 3D shoots, 2D shoots, an IBO round for bow hunters who really want to try a challenging course. And of course, the long bear shoot will be back. Big prizes for shooters who pop the bullseye on the target on the bear at about 150 yards. If you look carefully, watch for this arrow. It hits just below the pie plate, an inch or two below about seven o'clock. Lots of archery at the outdoor fair. In the auditorium, we'll run videos of walleye fishing and deer hunting between the formal presentations, which are the duck calling contest at three o'clock Saturday. Callers from all over the state and the Midwest will be competing for a shotgun and a chance to compete in the national competition at Stuttgart, Arkansas. At 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Saturday and 2 p.m. Sunday, Kathleen Marquardt, the president of Putting People First in Washington, D.C., will be giving an address in the auditorium about her efforts and the efforts of the Michigan chapters to combat what they feel are unreasonable, illogical, and fanatic efforts to enforce the so-called animal rights movement on everybody. At noon on both days, I'll give a talk in the auditorium on the subject of Michigan Outdoors, a look into the future. Naturally, I'll talk about the TV show, the new directions of the Outdoors Club, focusing on shooting sports and getting new people into hunting and fishing. I'll answer questions about the lawsuit, its status and effects, and I'll talk about our DNR that has grown out of touch with Joe Lunchbucket Sportsman. Now, the rest of the time, I'll be working behind the high school with the shooting shows. We'll present two shows, one called Dangerous Weapons, where we demonstrate weapons as they really are, and one called The Fun of Shooting, which has some shooting demonstrations like you've never seen, brand new events based on some of the shooting you've seen at the fair in years past. <laughs> hey! There we go, French roll, someone yeah. hand. Now I wanna address this thing about the shooting show at the fair where I'm gonna be shot uh, wearing a bulletproof vest by a 45 caliber bullet, 
Some people have called up, objected to this, saying that's bad to show. It's bad to have a gun pointed at anybody. Well, where are you folks? Have you been writing letters to CBS and NBC about all the shoot 'em up shows? Have you written letters about Die Hard and Rambo? Have you objected at the circus when they throw knives at people or, or, or shoot uh, cigarettes out of people's mouths? I mean, all of these things are dangerous, but there's so much on television that is baloney about guns. Uh, two weeks ago, I saw on Stuntmasters a portrayal of someone being shot. That gave me the idea that not only is that baloney, the way they portray people being shot on television, the use of machine guns, handguns, the, so much of what you see on television is not real. I don't believe kids know the difference between fantasy and reality, and this demonstration is going to be a part of a show we call Dangerous Weapons at the Outdoor Fair. We do another show, The Fun of Shooting, but this is the dangerous side and is very reality-based. And believe me, it's going to be something that will turn a lot of people's heads and hopefully start a new era of gun education, which I hope to begin right on this program. We've got a different recipe called fish chili from Lois Bone. And her recipes always have different ingredients in it. She kind of substitutes. We've got uh, green pepper and onion and some water. And because these aren't going to fry, they're just going to kind of boil a little bit. Going to add some tomatoes and tomato sauce. And then we're going to add some spices. Hmm. So this is a fish chili? Fish chili, right. Uh, it's got know. cayenne pepper, and you can adjust that. If you want it hotter, you can add more. It's got basil leaves, marjoram, and cumin. Hmm. Well, cumin, now that's a Mexican flavor. Right, I, yep. And I you, like that. Yep, and you can taste it in here. It does come through in this recipe. And again, hmm. you can adjust it. Um, if you like it, go ahead and add more. And then you're going to add potatoes and kidney beans. <laughs> and then hmm. rather than hamburger or venison burger, we're going to use uh, salmon. Hmm. And it's just, uh, you just chunk it up and it's not pre-cooked or anything. It just goes right into the fish or right. into the into the tomatoes, the chili mix. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Oh, corn too. Right. Yep. Like I say, it's got different um, ingredients. Just a little bit of everything, but they really come through. Well, I bet Charlie Keenan is going to raise his eyebrows at this one. Well, I usually don't like fish soup. I like chowders, but not fish soup. And this one right here. Is, is fantastic. The chili spices with the salmon, excellent taste. Mm -hmm. When I saw the name fish chili, I thought, oh boy. But it really does just blend very, very good together. Uh, this is a Lois? Mm -hmm. Lois, Lois Bone, yep. <laughs> I tell you, this is, she experimented. Yes. She was going crazy. She's like, I gotta think of something wild and crazy. <laughs> was that a hamburger or venison or whatever? And Co so. Corn, beans, tomatoes, potatoes. The fish, I gotta admit, Lois, it threw me right off the bat. <laughs> the first three, four, five bites, I said, why'd she put the fish in here? But now, I don't know, the fish is just kind of a part it of it. Sure is. Well, you're always looking for something new, something exciting mm -hmm. you can do with uh, salmon and other fish, and this one hits the spot. I think the beans with the fish and all, somehow, right. once yes. you get onto it, really good. <laughs> yep. Really great. This is a chili, huh? Yep, that's what it's called, fish chili. Yep. Mm. You can get that recipe in our Outdoor Digest magazine. Get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, naturally, we're going to have a report on the outdoor fair. You'll see the activities you missed if you don't make it up there this weekend. We'll also have a story on pheasants, Sichuan pheasants, ringneck pheasants, their survivability, adaptability in Michigan. What is the future for pheasant hunting anyway? All this and more next week right here on Public TV.